Principles of Economics, My Complete Guide to Understanding Economics is now available in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook from safeddeen.com, Amazon, and many more booksellers worldwide. And now I am also teaching a course based on this book on my website, safeddeen.com. Principles of Economics will run the whole academic year from September to June and will have a new lecture every two weeks, as well as weekly live online discussion seminars open to learners from all over the world and from all walks of life. Whether you're a student, a professional, or a retiree, you are making economic decisions every day, and this course will arm you with the wisdom of centuries of economists to improve your economic decision-making. You'll also get a free book of Principles of Economics if you sign up for the course, and if you do it before September 20th, you'll get a 20% discount. Go to safeddean.com and sign up now. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to the show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. CrowdHealth is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable healthcare. CrowdHealth holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin. It negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash upfront without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern healthcare insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for CrowdHealth and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coiner friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning everyday spare change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. Get paid in Bitcoin regardless of who you work for and regardless of who is paying you. All thanks to a premium service I personally love and use, and that is Bitwage. Thanks to Bitwage, I receive my books royalties in Bitcoin. It is cheaper, faster, and easier. It is a true set it and forget it system, and Bitwage has been offering this premium service since 2014. Anyone can sign up and use it right away. No restrictions or limits. Fully non-custodial. You can even split your incoming payment. Get part in Bitcoin and part to a bank account you specify. It could not be easier and I cannot recommend Bitwage highly enough. Go to bitwage.com and sign up now and get paid in Bitcoin with your next payment or salary. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Tour de Meester. Tour is a longtime Bitcoin analyst and investor. He's the founder of Adamant Research and he is an advisor to Blockstream and Unchained Capital. Tour has written some of the oldest, if not the oldest, research reports on Bitcoin, explaining the case for Bitcoin and the economics of Bitcoin and the bullish case for Bitcoin. And he's uh, published these periodically over the past, what is it now, 11 years, I think? I think 12 years, yeah. 12 years, yeah, 12 years. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Tour. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So... Oh, generally, whenever we have a guest who's into Bitcoin, we'd like to begin with the backstory. So tell us how you fell down the rabbit hole 12 years ago. And Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
So I was into Austrian economics starting from 2005. Uh, me and some friends, we uh, kind of bumped into this book by Hans Hoppe about um, democracy, the God that failed, like, you know, criticizing democracy. And so that's how slowly we learned about, oh, this thing called the Austrian school. And so, yeah, we were really passionate about that. Uh, founded the Rothbard Institute in, in Belgium, uh, translated some books and um, and then gradually for me, that interest evolved into like wanting to do something more uh, concrete in terms of like, w what do I do with this knowledge? So I started writing about the present day economic situation and then the banking crisis came along and I started getting really worried about very high inflation eventually in the Eurozone and, and just a prolonged uh, crisis depression situation. So from that point of view, I started writing a financial newsletter. I worked with a publisher. Uh, it was all in Dutch, but we had a pretty large audience uh, together. And uh, and so I was looking for things that would maintain and, and maintain value and increase in value during a, a, an inflationary depression. And so I became a gold bug. Um, there were some other early Bitcoiners who kind of came from that angle. And I also did research uh, traveling. I traveled to Spain. I traveled to Latin America because I, I wanted to know what a depression, what what people do in, in distressed economies. Like, what do they actually do? What do entrepreneurs do? How do they think? And so it was on one of those trips to Argentina that some friends of mine told me about Bitcoin. They were mining Bitcoin in their basement and it was 2011. It was just the perfect time for me to get to know this. And I also, I had the background to, to understand some of the, some of the situation. And I was actually lucky enough to, um, the year prior uh, to have been at a Libertarian Alliance conference in London where uh, the son of Milton Friedman talked about anonymous e-cash. Like he, it's still online somewhere, his, uh, his speech about anonymous e-cash. And he, he painted a bit of like a grim dystopian uh, future with that. But I think it did. Was that the son or the grandson? Is it Patry or David? No, it was David. Yeah, it was David. David, Friedman. okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's how it got started for me. I, I, I took like six months to research it. And, and by that time, Bitcoin had like dwindled down because there was a little little bubble. It, it went up to $30 in 2011. And then it went down to like $3. And so yeah, like we were ready with the newsletter and I, I started recommending it and following it as a, as a part of our currency basket. Yeah. And so when was the first report published? Was it in 2011 or 2012? So, so I was writing about this in Dutch for my newsletter, and then early 2012 is when I put out my first report, and I sent it to Zero Hedge, and I remember I was so proud that they accepted it, even though they kind of were like, they were very skeptical in the beginning. They kind of wrote like, oh, here's a, here's a guy, and, and it was, the report was a, bit, was a bit portrayed as a criticism of the ECB and the BIS, so I think that's what made it made them decide to publish it. But yeah, that was my first uh, Bitcoin report. Yeah. It was called Bitcoin Seen Through the Eyes of a Central Banker. Yes. Yeah, we'll post a link to it in the show notes. And uh, I, I remember reading it a long time ago, and it was, uh, it was pretty fascinating. I mean, it's, it's uh, a lot of the main ideas there are still the main ideas that continue to pop up for everybody who gets into Bitcoin right now, because in a sense, they're eternal. The fixed supply and the determined monetary policy and the fact that you can't mess with the money to the money monetary policy. All of that sounds um, really very appealing to a lot of people. And it's, um, it, it's, 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 it's almost like a blast from the past to read it all back then. <laughs> well, it was also interesting at the time that to see this stuff as new as it was through the eyes of the BIS because they had they put out a report about bitcoin that's that's uh, they called it digital currencies something like that but so they had written about ecash in the past in the 90s even and so it, the concerns are just so telling right they were they were afraid that they couldn't stop it and then and then they were speculating of like how could this undermine fiat currency and what could we possibly do to mitigate this so in a way it's like the early seeds of this like counter reformation that we're now seeing where they're like coming out full blast with central bank digital currency. Like it's, you know, the only reason central bank digital currencies exist, that whole idea is because it's a reaction against Bitcoin. But so anyway, it was, it was interesting to see that even early on, they were a little uncomfortable to see something like Bitcoin emerge. Yeah, it's very astute of them. I've got to give them credit for that. They should be uncomfortable. <laughs> we're, we're about to make them a lot more uncomfortable as time goes by. 
I mean, to imagine that they were saying those things and you were saying those things when Bitcoin was at like $10 or $30 or Yeah, whatever. I think the mar market cap of Bitcoin was, I don't remember, but I think it was like 50 or $100 million, like the entire market cap, yeah. Yeah, even looking back right now, it's, you know, rather than being stuck by the foresight of people like you who wrote this stuff early on, you're almost more stuck by just how insane this sounds. Like these people are talking about internet coins that are worth uh, $2 each and there's 10 million of them out there. And they're already talking about it replacing central banks. And uh, it's it, it, it's pretty startling. I mean, it's we, we still sound delusional that we say it now, a oh, 1,000x further down the road. Most people still think we're delusional when we say this. Yeah, and but then again, yeah, then again, it's like it's like what Peter Thiel says. It's like you you either have zero or you have one, and there's not really anything in between. Like with with especially with money, and so once you have a, a type of money that feels exciting, then it's it's kind of hard to not speculate about what what does it mean for it to go to one. Like what does it mean to just be the monopolist, and it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy that way. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is uh, <laughs> this is pretty fascinating. Now, I, I, you mentioned you think that CBDCs are a reaction to Bitcoin. Would you, would you really say that that is the case? Or, I mean, wouldn't it just be the fact that everything's getting digital, central bank currencies would have been introduced with Bitcoin or without Bitcoin? Because I think I, if I were to argue the opposite of that, I would say you know, the unique thing about Bitcoin was the ability to make digital cash that was anonymous. Uh, no, sorry, not anonymous, that was uh, decentralized, that was... Uh, that did not have a trusted third party in charge of it. But you don't need that for CBDCs. In fact, that's the whole point of CBDC, to make it centralized and to make them in charge of it. So they could have gone for digitization anyway um, without there being Bitcoin. Without, you know, if we hadn't had this decentralization, I think centralizing forces in the digital world would have just naturally wanted to digitize central bank currencies. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I always like I I I I get confused always when they talk about you know we're digital like it wasn't money digital since the seventies or earlier, and so like what exactly you're doing? And then for a while I was like, oh, but we're gonna put it on a blockchain thing. But then now they're not talking about that anymore. So I feel like it's it's true, you know, like people want cash more available to them, and and I I this this was an evolution that would have happened anyway. But I do think that the branding and, and the, the way they talk about this stuff and also the speed with which that they're advancing, I think that is a reaction to Bitcoin. Uh, it's a very clear adversary, whereas before they, they would maybe have put out plans and then think about the next 10, 20 years. To, like, usually it's a crisis that, that uh, spurs especially governments to change because they're so slow and bureaucratic. They, they need to like have a feel the fire, so to speak. Yeah, I guess that's probably the case. Yeah, I think there, there, there there's definitely an element of that. I, just, I think it's a complement to Bitcoin. If you look at a lot of the uh, literature that they produce, a lot of it is framed as a kind of, if we don't do CBDCs, this thing is going to get out of hand and uh, Bitcoin is going to eat our lunch. So good luck to them. <laughs> yeah, also like, to me, it's like the whole CBDC story is worthless unless they're going to back it by some real assets. Because like that is that that's the big crisis. Of like fiat is not backed by anything. If they want to salvage somehow government money as as an idea, they need to start backing it with something. Uh, and right now, we're at the phase where people are starting to use government bonds basically as a as a, a cash substitute, almost like a, definitely a, a place to save your money. So that's that's the you know stage number one, and I think stage number two is going to be probably taking a page from the tether playbook, where you you just follow you know what they're doing, and and your excess profits you invest that in some real assets. But I mean, I think we need much higher inflation before we start seeing that. Yeah, I mean, I I, I tend to think of the CBDC as um, I mean, I don't think they're going to be backing it in their mind. Um, they don't think that the government money needs any backing other than the fact that you have a bunch of central bankers get on TV and tell you, we are the authority and we know what we're doing. Shut up and uh, do what we tell you, peasant. I think that's what they understand as backing. So I think what CBDCs are going to be doing is just kicking the can down the road in the sense oh, of yeah. just 
more of the same. I mean, as you said, fiat money is already digital. Central bank currencies are all already digital. So it's only what, 5% of dollars or 10% less than five, I think, that are printed as in the form of physical very bills. Yeah very, yeah, very, very small percentage of uh, the world's central bank's monies are uh, physical. The vast majority is already digital and it has been for a long time. And the digital uh, percentage continues to increase over time. So what I think is the, the um, my hunch here is that this is going to be some kind of new Bretton Woods moment wherein they're going to try and present it as if it's a new thing, you know, as the dollar and the current uh, set of decrepit fiat currencies begin to crack more and more, they're going to, I, I think my, my hunch has been for a couple of years, and I did a podcast episode about this, one of the early ones, maybe episode like 40 or 50 or something like that. My hunch is that it's going to be, oh, inflation is happening because of all of those reasons. And of course, there is an infinite number of reasons other than money supply increase uh, that are happening. So I'm doing a thread right now on Twitter of collecting, every day I'm collecting a new um, fiat economist explanation for inflation that does not involve um, an increase in the money supply. And I'm quite optimistic this thread is going to be going for a while because every day we have a new contender. So uh, the Swedish central bank was blaming Beyonce. Um, some American economists were blaming Ty Taylor Swift. And uh, it's always new, new. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, corporations have gotten so greedy. It's like, what? what I know. Were you before then, like, what? What changed? This is the, this this is the really evil thing about capitalists, too. It's that they <laughs> wait until the government and the central bank print money to help poor people, and then they get greedy. Yeah. So that governments <laughs> are uh, so to stop governments from helping people. It's so perverse. Uh, obviously, I'm joking. But yeah, so there's always going to be a whole bunch of excuses for why the money supply is uh, irrelevant and it's actually inflation is happening because of other reasons. And uh, I think you combine that with a sense of, well, digital currency seems to resist that kind of inflation. So we are now introducing new currency that's going to be digital, which means that it's going to be Beyonce and Taylor Swift proof. Um, it won't be inflation it won't be inflationary because, you know, this is going to be like Bitcoin. It's going to have blockchain technology, which means that a Taylor Swift concert isn't going to cause its value to decline. That's going to be, I think, the pitch with which they're going to. Right. Uh, and, and yeah, I agree. And also in their mind, like the more granularly they can control where the money flows in their mind, like that's how you control inflation. It's it's uh, it, it goes to the wrong places. Like we need to make sure it goes to the right places where we want it to go. Um, so I, I totally agree. Miley Cyrus concerts rather than Taylor Swift. Yeah, right. That's what the central bank <laughs> should be doing. If they distribute to fans evenly between these yeah. <laughs> rock stars and pop stars, then we wouldn't get right. inflation. Yes, you're right. And CBTCs are the only way to do that. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> oh, my God. But so, yeah, I agree. And then and then I, I do think, you know, eventually, because, I mean, it, it probably we probably agree just depending on timelines. But we saw that in France as well, where they, you know, with the Asinia crisis, they kept rebranding until finally you were just bankrupt and like you lost the trust of the entire population. And then, you know, and then then there is all of a sudden a new generation of managers who are open, who have maybe read, you know, maybe read one of your books about like sound money or something, the new wins. And then and then you can start talking about a, an asset backed currency. Um, but so, yeah, I agree that we're going to crash into a wall before fiat money transforms yeah i think it's it's uh, i think it's going to be just a rebranding attempt and uh, it's going to buy them time i think it'll work to some extent because a lot of people will believe it and a lot of people are going to increase their cash balance in fiat once uh they tell them that this one can't be hurt by beyonce um i see a lot of new memes coming out of this <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I think, you know, the, um, you look at a place like Lebanon, I mean, the currency there has already gone um, down uh, something like 97% so far. So it's been completely destroyed. So basically, all, everybody who had any money in the lira, in the banking system, whether it was in the lira or in the dollars that are held by the banking system, it's all gone. You're at 3%, 5%, 10% of the right. original uh, valuation. So practically, there's no money left. So, you know, even if you had a, if you had $100 million, you only have two, three million dollars left. 
So that means there's very, very little money being held in liras. And so the inflation doesn't really work. And yet, there's an enormous amount of stubbornness. It's, it's, um, it's learned helplessness, helplessness, where people just don't have the capacity of understanding the idea that you can live without your local central bank's shitcoin. It's, it's impossible for them to just understand that. So they continue to witness their savings lose value. They continue to cling on to the hope that it's going to be uh, recovered someday, somehow, that, you know, one day the politicians are going to get together and fix this and bring the money back. And essentially, I think the majority of people are eternal bag holders. They'll keep holding bags forever. And any new rebrand, you know, here, I mean, the politics in Lebanon are massively dysfunctional in this case, but any kind of rebrand is going to up people's faith in this quite remarkably, I think. Yeah, it is really remarkable. You're right. I mean, it, it's, I mean, I guess maybe it, you have to like know what it's like to really grow up in a world where there is no alternatives because you do see that too. Like I remember in Argentina when I was there, like the only reason they were mining Bitcoin is because they couldn't buy it on Magox. They couldn't, you know, send fiat money across the borders. And so I imagine for people that have been kind of living in this financial prison, it's, um, it, it's maybe sometimes too painful to think about alternatives, even though now they're becoming real. Like, you know, you can buy Bitcoin pretty much any any square meter on the planet, you can find a way to buy Bitcoin. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. All right, so your first report, the idea was uh, Bitcoin from the eyes of a central bank. Well, what was the uh, punchline? Could you share it with us or give us a summary of it if you still remember it? It was basically keep an eye on Bitcoin. Like, you know, fund managers, investor, like you should keep an eye on Bitcoin and, and check out what's going on there because, uh, you know, clearly something's going on that, the BIS is rattled by this. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think so. All right. So then days go by, Bitcoin shoots up, and then you keep publishing more reports. I think you published one in um, uh, called, a uh, uh, pretty memorable one is Bitcoin in heavy accumulation mode. Oh, that was later. The, the one I did in, in the middle was 2015, and that was how to position for the rally in Bitcoin. So yeah. That was like oh, yeah. $250 Bitcoin and something like that. Yeah, that was 2015, which was, I mean, 2015, uh, this bear market was brutal, but I think 2015 was probably even more brutal. This bear market had a lot of, you know, Bitcoin had a couple of years ago, we had uh, El Salvador and Michael Saylor and um, all of these reasons to believe that this time is different and we're just going to keep going up forever. But back then, 2015, I mean, people just forgot about Bitcoin. Bitcoin dropped to like 150 or something. Well, yeah, because... I don't know if, if if your audience knows, but uh, in 2014, Bitcoin rallied from about thirty dollars all the way to twelve hundred dollars, and so that was the high point. And then we slowly started to deteriorate, and and it went all the way down back to one hundred fifty dollars at some point. So so that's like a eighty five percent crash, and and in while that was happening, um, Mount Gox the by far, it's hard to imagine now, but imagine there's basically one exchange, you know, for years and years, there's one exchange that people go to and a few that are maybe like an X, say that Mt. Gox was like 80% of the market. And then there were a few that were like 5% of the market, depending on where you live. So yeah, that, that exchange went bust. And uh, a lot of people were confused and they thought that Bitcoin, the company had gone bust. Like they, they just had never understood what Bitcoin was. And so, yeah, there were a lot and a lot of obituaries in the media about that Bitcoin was dead and it was over. And I remember, you know, I remember thinking during that bear market, like me and my wife were talking, like, should we, should we sell? Like, you know, it was really like, and then eventually it was kind of like, yeah, but we're already this low. Like, you know, why don't we just see what happens? <laughs> but it was true. Like for a while, people were numb, were very numb in, in that period. But so, yeah, so it was felt important for myself to write that report and, and to kind of gather my thoughts about oh, what's really going on here. Yeah. And also at that point, I mean, there was basically no Bitcoin Twitter. I mean, there were a few people that are, were on Twitter to, talking about Bitcoin. You were one of the earlier ones, one of the first people I discovered on Twitter, I remember. And the, the, there was really no kind of Bitcoin world. There was Bitcoin talk. There was the forums that were yeah. active, but that was mostly like engineering and some like pump and dumps. 
And then there was the Reddit, which was more for general news. That was mm-hmm. pretty good until maybe like 100,000 people. Like once it got big, it, it just, um, it, it, uh, it stopped being interesting. Yeah. But it was a pretty astute report to be writing that in 2015, because at that point, I mean, it was an excellent time to get in. So we'd already crashed from about 1,000 to 200 or 150 or 250. And at that point, everybody had lost oh, very little attention. And then if you got in at that point, you did very well, because by uh, 2017, it shot up to about 17,000. Yeah, we, I think uh, uh, on bits it went to 20,000, yeah. Depending yeah. on which exchange you looked at, but yeah, it, it definitely it. it uh, there was a massive rally, and some of it was greed. I think like there was definitely a lot of misguided ideas about what Bitcoin could do or what you know blockchain could do, and all these you know initial coin offerings that were happening. Ethereum was soaring as well. So, but yeah, I mean, definitely it gave Bitcoin lots of exposure. Um, it was it was a, a great time. A lot of people got involved. Like they learned about Bitcoin for the first time in 2016, 17. So, yeah. you know, you got to reach them somehow. And price is an excellent, you know, way to get a signal across the globe. Yeah, it's really the most powerful marketing. It's really, you know, uh, people like to mock number go up technology, but it's... It's what it comes down to. I mean, if the price of Bitcoin was dropping at, if, if the value of Bitcoin or the price was dropping in, you know, the, the real market value in terms of real goods and services or the dollar exchange rate, if that was dropping at 10% per year, they, then Bitcoin can't work. I mean, it, it won't exist. It won't be a secure network. It won't function. Nobody will have an incentive to hold Bitcoin. I mean, some people obviously will uh, for some whatever reason. That's the amount of demand for holding cash balances in Bitcoin. If you know, you know, let's just assume hypothetically, there was a way of algorithmically determining that the price of Bitcoin is going to drop by 10% per year. And everybody knew that, you know, you're going to get a 10% haircut per year by holding on to Bitcoin. It's going to buy you 10% fewer apples uh, per Bitcoin every year. In that case, very few people are going to keep cash balances in Bitcoin. So you're going to have a small um, market capitalization, even if there's a lot of people in the network, you know, even if the the tech was so outstanding to use uh, because of, say, privacy or because of speed or it was something about it that was just completely outstanding that meant it had, say, hundreds of millions of users. But if it was losing 10% per year, those people are all going to be holding cents or dollars, ultimately, very few, very small amounts. And so with a small market capitalization, the network is unlikely to be secure and it's unlikely to grow because at the end of the day, the people who use it continue to get poorer and the more you use it, the poorer you get. And uh, yeah, we can, you know, there's a lot of tech people who are very uncomfortable about the price cheering, cheerleading and the, the fixation on the price. And I can sympathize and I can understand that I'm generally not the kind of person who's heavily concerned with uh, financial returns. And, uh, you know, I, I don't base my worldview on things in terms of how well they perform on the stock market or whatever. But in this case, if you're going to be honest, you have to admit that it's really all about the price. It's important. It's very important. And and there, there's a related issue that people have found out along the way is that it, it is in part, thanks to Bitcoin's scarcity, that the price can keep going up. And uh, there were some experiments early on where people thought like, no, 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 like, you know, the price cannot go up too much. Uh, then a currency is going to stop being useful. And also we need to find a way to pay for developers, etc. And so, for example, Frycoin was one of the early experiments with an inflationary cryptocurrency. It was basically a, a clone of Bitcoin where they tweaked the the parameters a little bit. And I remember uh, Vitalik Buterin was a fan of that, the idea that you would have a, I don't know, I think it was like a 5% inflation every year forever. And and what you and I are talking about now, it's like, yeah, that's the reason why nobody knows what Frycoin is because it's a guaranteed, you don't know by exactly how much, but you do know over the long run, it's going to dilute. The value is just going to go away, the, the economic value of one coin. And so that's why people prefer Bitcoin as, as the standard. Yeah, I'm just looking up Frycoin. I I remember it. I've heard about it. I looked into it. But yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful chart to look at. So <laughs> we can for the listeners, it basically goes to zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if, if you've seen a shitcoin chart, you've seen them all mostly. Yes. <laughs> um, but 
we're still going, I'm going to share this one because it's really nice to look at. <laughs> but so part of why people thought that this might be true is because this is the rhetoric that we've heard from central banks and from Keynesian economists for decades now, you know, that we need to create more money in order to balance the value, et cetera, et cetera. And the beautiful thing about Satoshi's, you know, open source code is that now all these experiments can just be done in the free market and, uh, and the best idea wins. Yeah, here it is. Check it out. What a beauty. <laughs> Do you have a log scale for that? Oh, it's just... <laughs> Yeah, log scale. I mean, that makes it look slightly less terrible. Oh, but yeah. It's it's been from point one to point zero zero two. I'm surprised it even still has a price. Is it get does it get cut off at some point? Or I guess oh, you you can uh, go back further in history, maybe. Oh wait, this is. Oh yeah. Yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Gets more impressive. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Good job. I mean, that's, but th this, this makes it look so much nicer. Well, actually, this is like, uh, this is an example of actually a fairly innocent project compared to most of the ICOs where it's really a pump and dump scheme. Like, I think at least the founders of this had like uh, an honest agenda. They genuinely thought maybe they were doing something good and there was no pre-mine as far as I know. Yeah, let me, let me, let's obviously uh, see it in Bitcoin terms. That's going to look even better. Wow. No, that's a flat line. Yes. That is amazing. <laughs> and that's a log scale. That's pretty impressive. That's very, very nice. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, it's, it, it's really what it comes down to. And this is, this is the beautiful thing about Bitcoin. It's, it's just brutal free market economics. You can, uh, you can um, and, 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 you know, when it's freed from the mechanism of theft to keep propping up bad ideas because it's all digital and people can opt in and out. And so your Keynesian ideas have to go out there and compete. And yeah, this is a good reminder. We should, we should bring this up more often when Keynesians um, bring up their uh, criticisms and ideas for how to improve Bitcoin because, uh, the, you know, we have this eternal September problem where there's always noobs who come in and they think their unique genius ideas are really what has been missing. And I guarantee you there's been a shitcoin that tried that. And if you just... Absolutely. There was even a period, and this is kind of 2013-ish, there was a period where uh, there was there were national cryptocurrencies. People thought this was going to be a thing. Like they would do like the Dutch Gilder and it was supposed to be distributed in the Netherlands and people there would use it. And, and then there was Aurora Coin and they did an yep. airdrop among people in Iceland and... And yeah, it was just it up now. looking back, it was delusional. Like, why would you have a digi an open digital currency that it can only be used for some reason within the boundaries of one country? It was, I don't know, but for a while people thought the Spain coin, I remember as well, that was another one. So yeah, those are all in, in the crypto graveyards. I've, I've never heard of Spain coin before, mm -hmm. but I have heard of Aurora coin. And here it is, another beautiful, beautiful <laughs> illustration of what the the market does to gains in economics. And people were so excited, chart. like, oh my God, they're airdropping it to every Icelandic citizen. This is going to be incredible. <laughs> and then nobody bothered yeah. to cash it in. And Yeah. Now I've always, I've always thought it's going to be one of the most incredibly stupid things about our era. When you try and explain to people that uh, the way that money works in this world, in this day and age, is that somehow it stops working when you cross borders. And it's, I think it, it, it's fascinating. Why would this be the case? Like imagine once, imagine explaining this to somebody once we've, we're through with this. It's just going to be completely normal that you're, you know, you cross a national border, your money still works, it's money. People across borders trade with one another. You know, um, uh, a shoe is a shoe in the US and in Canada. <laughs> uh, a sandwich is a sandwich in the US and in Canada. And yet money stops being money when it travels across the border from the U.S. and Canada, which is absolutely ridiculous. And again, <laughs> the early graveyard of the early shitcoins is just the uh, explanation of why these things don't work. They only work if you have a gun and a military to go around and force people to use them. And that's what the Keynesians always assume. is like, oh, we got to change Bitcoin. It's like they assume they have a gun that 
can force Bitcoin to change. Well, you don't. Yeah, but you know, you can try and uh, good luck to you. And get embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, and you can also launch your own shitcoin. Let's see how that works out. Well, we had lots of professor coins. So yeah, they definitely, they definitely try. What are the professor coins? Can you remember? Well, uh, I don't remember. I think, um, well, I, I would argue that Cardano is a professor coin because it's, it's mired in this, you know, aura of like, oh, everything is, they're all academics and they, they have all PhDs and they do peer reviewed things. And our algorithm is, you know, gilded because of that. So Cardano, I think it's ADA. Um, and then wasn't there Emin Gunsira? Didn't he also like promote a coin? He's like a Cornell or Yale professor, yeah. Cornell professor. There was just a time when you would just see these like academics that had previously been like huffing and puffing that Bitcoin was worthless. Like they would come out and promote their own coin. Yeah, of course. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's going to be fun watching them get discredited over and over and over and over again as their shit coins sink to irrelevancy. So, uh, so what was the case in 2015? What was your case for uh, accumulating Bitcoin to get back to that fort? Um, it was uh, just just a kind of a, an aggregation of a lot of the arguments that we we know now already and that were circulating and that I gathered. You know the network effects. I think um, before then already. No, that was later. But anyway, like we were all talking about what are the network effects of Bitcoin. Like what what are the and 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 also emphasizing that it wasn't just money that bitcoin doesn't have to be money now for it to be a, a a good thing to accumulate basically that store of value was more important in the first phase of of uh, something becoming a money and then uh, also the idea that um bitcoin is kind of like is a is a, a protocol stack i remember that was in the report as well that it's a, it's going to be a stack of protocol with layers and that the ground layer is kind of like it compared it with the early days of Paris becoming a city where it's an island. It was defensible in the middle of a river. And then slowly you start having some settlements. And then gradually there's roads being built, there's buildings. Uh, and then eventually it becomes a place known for fine dining and architecture. And so those are all the layers that come on top. Uh, and that once the idea is that once there is a certain momentum happening, you get the Lindy effect where why would you build a city right next to Paris? Like Paris is already there. And so similar to Bitcoin, like once you have momentum, uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't matter that the, the limit is at 21 million Bitcoin. Like it could have been 25, but you know, the oldest coin happens to be this one. And so just like with TCP IP, like, you know, there are just certain parameters. If you have enough, if you've figured it out well enough, that's good enough for it to be the base layer. So that was kind of the argument that we don't need a thousand coins. And that was 2015 and at $250 Bitcoin, and then Bitcoin kept on marching forward. But then, um, fast again, you also, I think you, there was a period in which you were sort of wary of the fact that there was going to be a crash and you didn't warn about it. I think you hedged by getting out at some point, right? Mm. Do I remember correct? I never, I never really got out. I mean, I, I, I always wanted to be psychologically prepared, especially after you know, witnessing and experiencing physically, you know, Bitcoin going from 1200 to 150. I just was always wanting to be psychologically prepared uh, for a bear market because I think the toughest one is when you, because you, you start building castles in your mind, right? You just extrapolate the price and, and it's normal. It's a human, you know, to, to, to try and imagine what your future is going to be like. And, and so to me, it's always been a way to stay sane and healthy is to, to just think about bear markets. Yeah. So, so I was warning, even though I, I didn't, I never aggressively sold any Bitcoin. Yeah. I sort of always have this kind of, you know, in the back of my mind, I think, yeah, it's going to crash, but it's just very difficult to act upon it because like, what are you going to do? Just buy a big chunk of dollars? Yeah, exactly. And also like the, the height of them, the, the, to me, it's almost easier to to identify the bottom of a bear market, uh, to me at least, because I just feel horrible. Like, that's my my very primitive gauge. It's like when I feel like shit, sorry, pardon my French. Uh, it, you know, you get these moments where there's capitulation and there's like another downturn in price. And, and we've already had three waves and then it's another one. To me, that's almost easier to find that like 
people are apathetic. They're no longer engaging in social media. They just feel sick. Uh, versus if you're in a, in a bubble, it, there is almost like the air is so thin, everybody's high. It's like, well, how much higher can you get? Well, to me, that's a lot harder to, to feel like, you know, sometimes like I remember like thinking we need a tattoo index. Like, you know, the more you see photos of people putting like a big Bitcoin logo on their, on their shoulder, like that is, that's a good gauge of like that we're, 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 we're too high, right? We're, there's too much exuberance. But yeah, so that's always, and, and I remember being cautious when Bitcoin was back at $1,500 in 2017. I was like, oh, and then it was at 3000 especially then. I was like, yeah, you know, this is starting to feel like, hmm. And then it went to 20000 So yeah, I, I've, I've stopped trying to call the top. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, it's, it's better to just uh, be psychologically prepared for whatever comes and, um, you know, stay solvent. Because there's a lot of, there's also a lot of money in the world. Why would we have trillions of dollars floating around and Bitcoin is still like a little, a little tiny gnome. You know, it's such a tiny little child. So who knows how much money it could absorb in any given bull market. Yeah, and that's the scary thing because, you know, you see this pattern repeat where the price crashes after a big giant rise after the halving. But there's a very good case to be made that one time it's not going to repeat. You know, there's going to be an escape velocity at some point where it doesn't crash or if it crashes, it crashes relatively briefly and relatively shallow. Yeah. Crash and then it shoots up. Like the gold price in Weimar Germany, right? It was the, there were gold, there were little tiny bear phases in the gold price during Weimar, but you know, looking back, it's just it it's just a meltdown of 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 the fiat money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In fact, like if you look at Lebanon, for instance, today, um, I think the the exchange rate is around ninety thousand liters for the dollar, and at some point it hit one hundred and forty thousand. So there's there was a fifty percent properly rally well maybe 40 percent yeah 40 percent rally in the lebanese lira so a, a few months ago you could have made a good 40 percent by buying uh by the by selling dollars and buying liras uh, might even outperform bitcoin you know over that period from the top to the bottom and, and that's the definition of picking up pennies in front of a steamroller right i mean exactly it's dangerous it's extremely dangerous and like yeah, all right, so you made it, and then what? Like, uh, when do you sell out? When do you cash out? It's uh, what, pe People look at the chart in retrospect, and they just, it's, it seems so obvious and inevitable that, yeah, well, it turned here, so I, was, I would have sold here, I would have bought here, but you have no idea when you're actually going through it whether it's going to actually be the top or the bottom, whether it's going to continue to rise or going to continue to fall. You have no idea. Yeah, and there's this phenomenon people speak of the wall of worry during a bull market. They call it the wall of worry. And it's because during the bull market, there's actually still a lot of doubt. And that's why you have these corrections. Of It goes down 30 40% in the middle of a bull rally. And, um, and, and looking back, you don't notice those. You don't notice those uh, corrections. But it's very scary when, when you, you're invested with a significant amount of money and then you, you, you wonder like, oh my God, was this the top? Like, should I sell? And so you've you, you got to be careful to not get shaken out of your position during times like that. Yeah. Now, um, during your time, you've, um, you've managed a fund where you've tried to make returns in Bitcoin. You're one of the very few people who's tried mm. to do their returns on a fund in Bitcoin. And this is... I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's like uh, running a race with an obstacle course uh, mm. while all of the other people are running without an obstacle course. Because, well, I mean, most, most money managers, or I should say, most people who opine on money management don't show their portfolio. Like the vast majority of people have very strong opinions about what you should do with your money. That the people that get on CNBC and the people that get on Bloomberg and the people that write columns in uh, fiat newspapers like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, they have very strong opinions that this is going to go up and this is going to go down and this is what you should do. And mm -hmm. we're in a bull market of this thing and in a bear market for those things. But the vast majority of them don't show you their portfolio. They're basically um, either selling you a book or they're, um, as most often the case, uh, trying to get you to invest in their fund or in the fund that they work with or the fund that they advise are old 
nemesis Nassim Talib is here. I, the poster child for that has made a career for 35 years of um, pretending to be a successful investor without ever showing any uh, record for it, which is like me pretending to be um, on the same level as Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo, right? Without there ever being any record of me playing professional football, but you know, I think maybe Doctor Doom is also up there, not Neuro Rubini. Yes, Doctor Doom is also another one. Yeah. He's, um, you know, he still makes his money consulting from uh, with the IMF and uh, and, and working at government funded universities. But he's very strong opinions about what you should do with your money. So these people can't even beat the S and P five hundred. They can't beat S um, index investing. Mm -hmm. They and and I mean, the few investors that can beat the S and P regularly over the long term, they are highly famed investors for the fact that they do that. You know, people like Warren Buffett or Stanley Druckenmiller or Paul Tudor Jones. I mean, they've done that and. Bill Miller, yeah. And they've done that and they've done it for years, for decades. They've managed to beat it. You could argue whether it's luck or whether it's skill, whether it's uh, intelligence or whether it was just they got lucky. But they put their portfolio out there and they do it. And uh, very few people can actually lay a claim to this. But it's very difficult to beat uh, the S&P 500. It's very difficult to beat index investing in fiat. Now, you are uh, running not just uphill, you're essentially running up a flat wall by trying to beat Bitcoin with your investing because Bitcoin massively outperforms the S&P 500. So this is a much, 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 much higher bar to clear, really. And so what was your experience about investing in Bitcoin? Sure, yeah. Or investments uh, that try to beat Bitcoin? Yeah, I've always, I've always um, wanted to create value for Bitcoiners, like do something that is, is you know, put out ideas that are valuable to Bitcoiners and possibly, you know, support services that are valuable to Bitcoiners. And so to me, there is just no substitute. Like if you're going to have an actively managed fund, either it's maybe uh, a venture fund, but for a long time, I just felt like Bitcoin was just so small that to invest the money instead in startups just felt like wrong. Even though I, I've made a few investments in Bitcoin startups over the years. But so, yeah, I just felt like if you're going to do a fund, well, you need a benchmark because how, how else are you going to gauge performance? You kind of have to choose Bitcoin as a benchmark. So, so thinking about that, the idea pretty quickly was like, well, if you're just going to trade, you know, because a lot of these funds were the crypto funds were just trading. And, and of course, if you just have a dollar benchmark or maybe even S&P, in a bull market, it's easy peasy to just make returns and then, and then get 20% because usually that's how it goes. If you, you have a benchmark, you outperform the benchmark, let's say you make, uh, to make it simple, you, you make $10 million for your investors, well, then you get to take home $2, $2 million for, for yourself, 20%. That's often how it's done, performance fees. And then there's a, a separate management fee as well. But so, yeah, for me, I felt like the honest thing to do, um, because I don't want to try to dissuade people from exchanging their Bitcoin for an inferior product, is to just take Bitcoin as a benchmark. But then it's like, okay, how do you do that? To me, just trading wasn't going to cut it because uh, in the U.S., you're, you're incurring uh, management fees for your uh, invest. Uh, sorry, you're incurring capital gains tax for your investors when you do that. And also, when, if Bitcoin goes down a lot, you all all of a sudden you create a hole for yourself that you cannot climb out of. Uh, and, and we've seen that over and over. At least at the time when I was launching my fund, that had not really happened yet. Like we didn't, the very aggressive funds hadn't really popped up yet. Most of them were more like uh, Barry Silbert's type where they would just have a, a bunch of startup equity. Like that was the, the model. And so the, the strategy that uh, we came up with was to basically short the dollar against Bitcoin and just uh, to, it's, to put it simple, it's the Michael Saylor strategy. I think uh, that was, yeah, it was two years before MicroStrategy announced what they were doing. But roughly speaking, that's what we did is, is we took the Bitcoin that people had saved prior. We took that on board. We didn't sell it. We just used it as collateral to borrow some dollars against. And then we had some some metrics that would uh, inform us how much leverage to take on, and it was it was a modest amount. And so then we would turn around and with those dollars buy more Bitcoin. And then the idea was that as the bull market would progress, we would be able to pay off all the debt, and we would have surplus, and that surplus would be the Bitcoin Alpha. It went well, like given how volatile things were in 2019, uh, I think it went pretty well. the The challenge for me personally was just that I 
I had crippling insomnia and I was just becoming aware of how bad it was and during that year. And I just started feeling less and less comfortable with managing not only my own money, but other people's money while I was having trouble, you know, focusing just uh, on a daily basis. And, um, and so eventually I decided that, and, and there may have also been a personality misfit or certain people are just have the kind of, um, the stamina, whatever you call it, the character to just handle that kind of situation or stress. And I think somehow I didn't, um, I'm not sure. I, I still feel like I'm not, I'm not a money manager. I could, I could, I could help with money managing. I can manage my own money, but uh, to do it for other people somehow that's really stressful. And so I wound down the fund. I gave everybody their money back and uh, we ended up, I, I, it's on Twitter somewhere, the exact number, but we ended up making a 4% loss against Bitcoin, which I felt terrible about. And I mean, of course it was my own money too. So, so I, I did, um, I had skin in the game in that sense. And uh, I do feel good that it was a good strategy. Like, had we just kept the fund running, we we would have absolutely because because that was we we kind of wound it down at maybe f- I think fifteen thousand dollar Bitcoin, twelve thousand dollar Bitcoin, something like that. And so you, you I mean, everybody knows in twenty twenty we ripped to sixty five thousand dollar Bitcoin. So twenty one. So I feel good about the strategy. Um, at twenty twenty one, yeah. So over that the next year and a half, uh, uh it did, yeah. It would have been phenomenal. So yeah, I feel good. It was so you did this. So so when well, when was the period in which you did this? Twenty nineteen. Yeah, twenty nineteen. Do you throughout twenty nineteen or what did it start in twenty eighteen or? Uh, I'm honestly like this is part of the reason of the insomnia. It's like how when exactly did we start? I I, I would have to look it up. I don't want to uh, pin myself down. But um, okay. Yeah, we ran it for a relatively short amount of time. Part of the challenge was also that. Uh, the market was just so excited about crypto in general that people wanted to invest in new coins and they just felt like, well, if you're promising, quote unquote, to outperform Bitcoin by maybe 10%, that's just not good enough for me. Or we want to see more track record. And so that's all fair. But it just meant that our overhead cost was pretty high. You know, we probably needed a, a higher AUM to... Um, yeah. To, to, to not, you know, lose money in that first phase. So, so basically we were at a crossroads where either I had to double down and chase down investors around the world or I would just wind it down. And luckily I wound it down because that was just before COVID and I, I'm really glad I didn't have to try and chase down more money during COVID. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the crash before COVID would have probably hurt you very badly if you were uh, doing that strategy. Oh, like that. That's a good question. That's a good uh, yes and no, though. I remember I remember like consciously planning for very, very low Bitcoin prices, you know, because like when you when you're only levered up five or 10 percent, you can take a lot like, you know, like like yeah. we see that with MicroStrategy as well. Like, uh, But the, the challenge was also that we didn't have access to as good a credit as Michael Saylor has uh, or MicroStrategy has. Like they are. um they are a uh, uh, stock listed company. Sorry, stock market um, publicly listed company. They have cash flow, and so the terms that they get on their loans are way better, right? They can issue notes over five years, and we were just uh, looking at one, you know, debt that that uh, rolls over every twelve months. So, so we couldn't really predict interest rates and things like that. Yeah, I think I mean uh, it's it's it it really seems to come down to timing. I think if you did that strategy. Um, starting in um, April 2020, then it would have been phenomenal. Yeah, it would have been insane. By the end of 2021, you know, you would have mm. arguably made a lot. I mean, there were a couple of big drawdowns along the way. As long as you were prepared for that, they would have been fine. But then, if you did that strategy starting at the end of 2021, you would have been murdered throughout the 2020. Too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Although, I mean, I mean, the indicators that I, and, and actually the, in my latest report, there's two indicators that, that I, I publish, um, that, that we developed with Tomas Bloomer, who was an advisor for us. Those indicators are pretty good actually at, 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 you know, calling out when not exactly the top, but when the market is overheated. So we would have deleveraged, uh, with that. That was always the plan. But the challenge was also that, you know, in that time, 2019, early 2020 is when, you had these other hedge funds that were showing incredible returns, like just, you know, 100, 200% returns. And so they just looked way more sexy than we did. 
And so a part, there was some, you know, part, part of me was like, is this too good to be true? Like, you know, there must be some downside risk uh, that of what these guys are doing. And of course there was, you know, we saw the, I forget the name of the fund, but there was one fund that- Three Arrows Capital. Well, yeah, but there was, there were a few funds before that, that, that closed down with like 70% losses, uh, really horrendous uh, results. So at least that helped me to feel a little better about, you know, our 4% loss that, you know, we, uh, we, we had been conservative. I mean, listen, like, uh, yeah, 4% in Bitcoin terms, you still beat fiat. So like, don't beat yourself mm -hmm. up too high, too hard. Um, you know, you're still beating all the fiat talking heads on CNBC with very strong opinions even while uh, losing next to Bitcoin. Yeah, plus I think Bitcoin Alpha is the future. You know, if, if you're going to actively manage money, like measure yourself against the champion, you know, like... Uh, you, exactly. You, you, you literally, Bitcoiners can store Bitcoin for zero cost. So so if you want to have access to that capital, you you got you to gotta do the work and show what you can do. Yeah, I think this is really, this is a point that I keep bringing up, which is, you know, you look at fiat people and every couple of weeks there's a new um, press conference or uh, announcement, you know, the unemployment numbers coming up with the um, interest rate decision of the Fed or the new industrial index of something or the other. The new data. And all these people live their lives around this stuff and they're constantly trying to second guess what's going to go on and they're trying to figure out how it's, you know, how to, how to allocate what happens if the inflation number comes in, then you should short the market, no, you should long this, long that, go long bonds, go long. And it's it's such a miserable existence, to be honest. Like, it, Oh my God, yeah. And often very, very smart people, like enormous intellectual capital is dedicated to this. Yeah. Yeah. And like those people could be out there doing productive things, like, you know, building an actual business that, you know, makes uh, food or uh, builds cars or something useful for humanity. Instead, they're basically... Gambling. It's 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 really gambling. What is the number going to show up? What's the BLS going to give us? What is yeah. and, and then what is Jay Powell going to do as a response to that number? And how will everybody else respond to his response to that number? And you're trying to play uh, that game and trying to come out ahead of everybody else. And it's just it's it's really difficult. And I the you know, tweet that, that I'm. Uh, keep recycling every time there's a um, there's a new announcement and people are glued to their fiat TVs and trying to find out what's going on is, look, at the end of the day, you know, you want to trade the fiat markets, go ahead. But remember, you know, you could just buy Bitcoin and live your life. You could buy Bitcoin and set up an actual business. Um, you could buy Bitcoin and go and play with your kids, get to meet your wife, um, get to know your kids' names instead of spending all of your life on uh, Bloomberg and CNBC, you could have a life, you know, and just hold Bitcoin. You just, you know, put all of your excess income in, into Bitcoin and keep accumulating it over time. And you need to compare what you're doing to the returns on Bitcoin. And I don't think, you know, even, even at the bottom of the uh, bear market, even at 16,000, you know, if you with a long enough, time horizon, if you look back over, you know, five years, mm -hmm. basically there's only a few weeks back in December 2022, December of last year, there's only a few weeks in which your average um, fiat investor would have beaten a Bitcoin holder, assuming the Bitcoin holder just lump some bot and waited five years. But if you're accumulating, if you're accumulating along the way, if your dollar cost averaging it's not even comparable. It's, yeah, I think uh, I saw your tweet about that, that like actually the uh, in the past week is the first time that literally anybody who has been dollar cost averaging during uh, starting from any date in the past is now in profits, is now yeah. basically in the green. That's that's incredible, right? It is incredible. It's it's It sounds like it's a definitely a wrong statistic when you first hear it, but then if you actually run the numbers and you look at it, you know, it is correct. So the, what the statistic says is, at any point in time, if you started daily buying Bitcoin, you know, one, whatever sum, if you started the same amount every day, same amount every day, if you did it 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, one year ago, one week ago, if you've been doing it yesterday, you had your Bitcoin was worth more than what you spent on it. And it seems unlikely because, you know, we fell from not 69,000 and the price now is about 31,000. But if you even if you started buying at sixty nine thousand, the price has fallen 
so much that it, you know if you just continued buying at 15 and 16, you more than made up for it. So you're still back, you're back in profit now. I, I wouldn't say it's the first time. I'm pretty sure this was also the case uh, at the beginning of the bull of, of the previous mm-hmm. bull market yeah. when you know probably Bitcoin was maybe around eight thousand or nine thousand, ten thousand, something like that. I would imagine at that point you would have had something very similar. If you'd started buying at 17, you would have bought also all the way down to three and four. So you'd have been positive. And I think it's just an enormously powerful statement when you think about it. Nobody, nobody who has been dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin um, ha- is down. It's amazing. It's incredible. Yeah, and that means basically no active management. That means you get to actually enjoy your uh, job, your wife, your kids, you get to have a life, you get to enjoy sports. You don't have to actually follow the CNBC. You don't have to care about what's happening with the interest rate. Like, I mean, it's it's so liberating for me that I just don't care. I have zero opinion about what's going to happen about anything in the in the market. I mean, I, and I see people just pulling their hair out because you know they get on the internet and they make a call and they say, you know, the stock market is going to crash or uh, the bonds are going to go up or this is going to go down. And then they get so invested in their narrative and then they start fighting with people online that no, it's going to go down. Or then, you know, they start rationalizing it. Oh, well, the Fed is manipulating the market and that's why it didn't go down. And I just honestly have no opinion. I remember at the beginning of this year, I remember Nassim Talib and his uh, fund that he advises, they said, you know, uh, this is going to be the biggest crash since the Great Depression and we are shorting the stock market with leverage and the stock market has just completed the best half. Uh, it's had in a very long time. One of the best halves ever. The best half ever for the NASDAQ, I think, and one of the best ever for the S&P 500. And now I don't claim I could have predicted that. I had no idea, but I have no reason to predict that. I mean, it's like asking me to predict who was going to win the NBA. Absolutely no idea. I don't follow the NBA and I don't know. So um, that I, and I don't go around telling people to go and bet on the Lakers or the Bulls or whatever. And I don't think you should be. I think uh, go get a real job. And if you want to watch the NBA, watch it recreationally. It's something that is a lot more interesting to watch than uh, the, the Federal mm-hmm. Reserve meetings. Yeah, we often wonder, like, how are people, like, in the 19th century, like, how are they able to build such, be- like, I was just literally looking, across, I'm here in the Bitcoin Commons in Austin, and across there was this beautiful hotel that was built in 1888. And just looking at it before we start recording, and 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 people wonder like how 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 are they able to build such beautiful things and uh, and and create incredible art? And I think part of the reason is that they didn't have to worry about what was happening to their money all the time. Of course, there were some banks that went bust sometimes, and so you had to be a bit careful. But by and large, people just had their life insurance, they had some savings, and that was it. Like you you didn't have to be exposed to stock markets. Um, that was just for professionals. Whereas today like take any uber and like the person there is like their grind their gears are grinding about how to invest their money and what to do and how to hustle because and that's i remember reading that in um i forget the name but there was a little book that was written in the 80s about how to how to prepare for hyperinflation and this this gentleman had actually traveled to latin america and interviewed like business operators and and uh, and uh, all kinds of people there to to understand like how, how does it actually work and and one of the things that I remember reading in that book is that in the boardroom of companies that actually survive hyperinflation, they all the time actually try to tea leaf read the financial markets. It's like, what's going to happen next? How do we prepare? Like, how do we maintain our cash flow? How do we not lose that? And and so in a way, that's where we're heading. Like people are people who refuse to switch to the Bitcoin standard are going to increasingly have to spend more and more time dealing with this crazy volatility. And we have the luxury, like us Bitcoiners, we have the luxury to think about beautiful things and raise our family. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it, it's, you see it. Um, I think this is why Bitcoiners enjoy going to conferences and hanging out at meetups so much because it's a very different mindset. You're not in that hamster wheel all day trying to figure out how to outsmart Jay Powell. Um, you're just out there thinking about your own life and it's, 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 it's massively liberating. It's it's enormous the difference that this does, and I think you know the the reason that people aren't as productive today is because they can't focus on doing those other things. So, like as you said, we'd have a lot more beautiful buildings if all of those people weren't out there tea leaf reading. Like all of these very smart people could be architects uh, instead of 
reading fed tea leaves. Just imagine, uh, and, 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 and yeah, and, and the point is, at this point, like, what's the point of running a construction company or running a factory? Because, you know, you have a business, you say you're making shoes or you're building buildings or you're uh, building cars, but none of your, well, not none, but increasingly more and more, the success of your business relies in almost entirely on your ability to read the tea leaves correctly. Because if you do shoes properly and then you don't read the fed tea leaves properly, your business is going to get wrecked. And if you do crappy shoes, but you know how to read the fed meetings properly, then your business is going to survive. So why get into the shoe business in the first place? Right. Why not just gamble? And that's why more and more intelligent people, you know, and then you see this, like in our generation, a lot of people go to university thinking, I want to be a rocket scientist. I want to doctor. I want to build this. I want to build that. And then they end up behind the Bloomberg terminal, running some numbers and trying to beat the Fed. Right. Well, and even construction companies are, are basically, they're playing with leverage all the time. And so they're, they're professional financial operators. Um, and, and yeah, the ones that are focused just on the building, they might go out of business because they, they just can't outbid the guys that, that are, you know, juggling with borrowed money. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So moving along, we're going through your reports chronologically. Mm -hmm. Now we get to the most recent one. Uh, I mean, if I've, I, I'm sure I've skipped some of the, uh, many of them. So feel free to uh, bring up any that you want, but I, I, ju I just, yeah, I did one every bear market. Uh, so we did 2015 and then I did one in 2019, which was the one you mentioned, Bitcoin and heavy accumulation. Yeah. That same year, I also did the Bitcoin reformation. That was 2019. Yeah. Hey, I want to get to that, but there was also when, when Bitcoin hit like 3000 and, and then 4000 is when I put out the report, I think. And I remember also end of 2017, you wrote no more uh, highs in 2018, which was a very good call. Oh, yeah. That was like a blog post. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That was a very good call because, I mean, I mean, at end of 2017, um, everybody just thought, that's it. We're going up forever and uh, it's not going to stop. Like we did just gone from, what was it, 3,000 all the way to, no, sorry, not 3,000. It was... Yeah, 150 basically to yep. 19,000. So 100x. <laughs> yeah, there was no reason to expect it to stop at any point. But you said, nope, not in 2018. And you were correct. So congrats on that. Thank you. Yeah, I think it was that uh, one of the things that we started seeing was that old coins, so you can, you can, the one of the cool things about Bitcoin is that you can look at the ledger, the, the blockchain, and, uh, and see what old coins are doing or w what any coin is doing. Uh, and so what we started seeing is that as that Bitcoin whales that had been holding on to Bitcoin for a long time, they were starting to move their coins around. And uh, so basically they were selling into strength. They were cashing out because they thought the market was going crazy, which really it was with the ICO madness and everything. Uh, so that's always a good indicator. Like you, you can really kind of look at what insiders are doing in the Bitcoin space, which you cannot do with gold, for example, or a lot of other things. So th there's some interesting ways to look at, at uh, Bitcoin activity that way. Yes, absolutely. So are these the indicators that you were mentioning in the, um, in your uh, new report? In the latest report as well. Yeah. Cause I, I wanted to kind of, yeah. I like the consistency. Like, you know, if we talk about them four years ago, let, let's have a look at them again. What are they saying today? Yeah, so those, those are the ones developed by Thomas Bloomer. And now Glassnode is, uh, has them live. If you subscribe to them, you can, uh, you can find those charts there as well. Yeah, Thomas Bloomer should mention him. Uh, may he rest in peace. He passed away a few years ago. He was a pretty astute and good analyst of uh, Bitcoin. Pretty older guy from Hungary, I believe. All smart yeah. people that come from Hungary. Yeah, no, and, and he was a very early Bitcoiner. He actually came from the banking world. So he was one of those people with a huge brain. And, uh, you know, he kind of used that to fight his way out of communism, but then eventually uh, really wanted to to leave a legacy. And, and starting in 2012, he's, I think, yeah, 2012, he started um, coding on Bitcoin. And he's the one that developed the Bitcoin Rust depository, which is now still very active. Like people are, are building software in, in the Rust uh, language. But he's actually the one that really 
help me understand how Bitcoin is going to scale. Because early on, I was, I don't know, I didn't know much about uh, computer architecture and things like that. And, and he just, very matter of fact, back in 2014, explained to me like, look, you know, you cannot make bigger blocks. It, it's, it's, it's not a way to scale. What you need to do is just build layers on top of it that will uh, have higher speeds and, and other features that are not available on them. And so, yeah, it just uh, it massively helped me in, in everything I've done in Bitcoin. Yeah. So this all brings us down to your latest report. And what is the main thesis there? Well... Uh, I, I kind of recycled my title from 2015, which uh, back then it was how to position for the rally in Bitcoin. And this one is how to position for the Bitcoin boom. And uh, yeah, we put it out when Bitcoin was $26,000. Once again, it it was published when Bitcoin was more than 75% below its previous all-time high, when sentiment was very apathetic when a lot of people thought uh, this is probably it the bubble is burst we see the beginning of a new bear uh, of a new bull market and so yeah again using the same metrics for example what we're seeing is that bitcoin whales are absolutely not selling into this rally like they are hodling they are holding because they know that uh this is just the beginning uh, so that's an important metric um i'm trying to think there was an there's another some other activity that we saw mm. Well, yeah, one interesting uh, metric to look at as well is that you can calculate whether the average Bitcoiner is either looking at unrealized profits or whether he's looking at unrealized losses. So that's the, you know, when people say I'm underwater, that's that thing, right? You, the Bitcoin price now is is so low that I'm actually in dollar, I feel embarrassed to tell my wife, basically. Like in dollar terms, I'm like, you know, below, below, um, I'm not making profits. I'm making losses if I if I would sell. So you can see that on the blockchain and you can kind of, you can aggregate that. And it's actually a very powerful sentiment gauge um, because at some point it goes so low, you get so many unrealized losses that it's capitulation. Like people feel, that's when you feel horrible. And, and you can just kind of feel it if you go online or you go to conferences, there's that like despondency and that started to change. So we actually are back now in, in optimism, like on, on a net basis, we're looking at some small unrealized gains again. So, so you, I don't know if you agree, Safe, but I, I feel like the sentiment is better the last couple of months. Uh, definitely one, uh, when we had the Silicon Valley Bank bailout, to, to me, that was like a big inflection point. People realized like, oh my God, they're going to save all these banks. That means they're going to print money forever. So eventually inflation is really coming back. They're not going to let the banks go bust. Um, yeah. So, um, so that's basically the thesis. Is like, you know, f- f- and, and then we go over a bunch of objections because that we're trying to anticipate the wall of worry. Like people are going to be worried about regulatory challenges, about what the price could do. What if the stock market crashes? Like, is Bitcoin going to be drawn down again? So we just address um, a lot of those um, concerns. Yeah, I mean, I think you could argue that you know that there's been also like. Um, there's been a rise in the stock market that coincided with the last rally in Bitcoin, but we are 100% off. So as we speak right now, Bitcoin's about exactly 100% higher than where it was at the bottom. And, and it's interesting to look at the, the, the S&P index divided by the Bitcoin price. You actually see like a nice, you know, um, wait, uh, the other way around, uh, Bitcoin divided by the S&P, I think that's that's what it is. Because you want to know, if, is Bitcoin stronger against the S&P? And so you see a nice uh, uptrend there, and there was a bottoming out, and then uh, now we're, we're back in the strength territory. So looking very bullish, Bitcoin looking extremely bullish against the stock market, because that's the, the objection of all these people that that are um, in the rat race and that, you know, that kind of look at uh, things on a day-to-day basis, they they always say like, oh, but Bitcoin is so correlated with the stock market. It's like, yeah, until it's not. You know, about 11 days per year, Bitcoin massively outperforms uh, stocks and, and, and uh, internet stocks and all just any asset on the planet. And so um, you just can't uh, assume the correlation is going to last. And it's already stopped. Yeah, I'm going to share it. In fact, I found uh, a website that collects these. That's worth looking into here. So if you look here, you see that they've got a very nice visual of Jay Powell um, (laughs) running his printer, doing what he does best. But yeah, so the S&P 500 over BTC is 
down 100%. Is that the red one? Is that the red graph? Yeah, it's the red one. Right. So since 2009, uh, 2010, it's basically down 100%, obviously, because Bitcoin's gone up. So yeah, and you can see there, it's once again, it's rolling over so that we're ready for another another down cycle. Yeah, like, and, and this, I think this red line is extremely important for people who keep falling into the trap of saying, Bitcoin is a correlated asset. Bitcoin is a correlated asset. And it's, it's for me, it's, it's, it's a hilarious thing to say because it's, um, I mean, you're not in the market to find correlated assets. You don't, or, or uncorrelated assets. You don't get a medal for finding the, for finding the lowest correlation coefficient. Um, you're in the market for getting the, uh, the highest return. And so the fact that they're correlated in the short term well, it doesn't really matter. Okay, yes, the day-to-day -day movements are correlated. On the day-to-day -day basis, there's a blood of liquidity. People put that liquidity into the S&P. They put it into NASDAQ. They put it into risk assets. And Bitcoin is one of those things. So if you're looking at the day-to-day, -day, which is what most people in fiat worlds <laughs> are only capable of doing because, you know, they... They have to take their money to the casino every single day. You know, you can't just not worry about it. You have to go into the casino every single day. And you have to, every day is a new fight to keep the money that you've already earned. But if you take the long-term view, then yeah, these day-to-day -day correlations don't matter because the long-term view is this red line here where we see basically uh, the S&P 500 is going to zero in Bitcoin terms. And it just continues to drop further and further. Yeah, also I would argue that people who are really into correlations is like, well, have a look at the, how the bond market and the stock market are actually getting increasingly correlated, which is like, that is, yeah. it's not supposed to happen, right? The bonds are supposed to be the safe haven and stocks are, you know, the risk on asset. But what do you do when they're increasingly correlated and they both go down at the same time? And I'm talking about against commodities, for example, right? It just, which is a bit of a proxy for our everyday cost of living, you know, what do you do then? And, and of course, the, the, the explanation is just that our economy has been massively overextended and we need to, you know, I, I think you, you wrote about it, right? The structure of production uh, has to, uh, is overextended and needs to, needs to uh, shrink back and we need um, a, a much bigger emphasis on the, the first phase of um, the structure of production, which is just basic goods, uh, just commodities are, are going to go up against uh, consumer goods. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, take that, correlation maximalists. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is another one of those examples of uh, they, you know, be, if you're following the day-to-day -day of the fiat uh, casino, you get so fixated on being right. You get so fixated on um, proving that your mental model is correct. And you get so fixated on winning the rat race, essentially, of of these investors that you miss sight of the real goal that you're after, which is you just don't want to get poor because of monetary right. policy. And Bitcoin is the cheat code. I mean, people hate the idea of a cheat code. They hate the idea that there should be that there can be an easy way. And I think this is this is the trap that a lot of intelligent and conscientious people fall into. They just don't accept the idea that, you know, I've spent the last 25 years of my career trying to beat the Fed. And, you know, waking up every morning and reading all of those newspapers and reading all of these uh, literature in order to try and, uh, you know, get a little bit more than the S&P 500. And now you can't just tell me that I just buy magic internet coins and grill some steaks, play, right. play with my kids and win. But they're like, no, 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 you don't understand. But I have to play Tetris all the all day long. I have to. It's like. No, you're just gonna lose if you. Oh, you're always gonna lose if you play Tetris. I'm like, no, no, no. But like, just buy some Bitcoin. Chill. <laughs> yeah, I, I just mean like the analogy with Tetris is that like the speed of the game always goes up, and like no matter how good you are, you're gonna lose. And so if you me if you use dollars as your measuring stick, you're gonna lose. No matter how much you outperform the dollar, you're gonna lose. If that's your benchmark, there's that classic classic. A tweet by um, Bitstein. Yeah, this this is uh, this is maybe the best tweet, a contender for greatest ever Bitcoin Twitter tweet. Um, there, let me share it. You, a Wall Street trader, spent years <laughs> in school learning the minutiae of finance, ten years of one hundred hour work weeks, never see family, 
super excited about your 10% returns this year. Me, a Bitcoiner, read some books, shit posted on Twitter, ate some steaks, enjoying 900% returns this year. <laughs> that's, that's spot on. Oh my God. And it's so true. And this was November 2017. So the price then would have been, I'm going to guess, something like $10,000, $15,000. I assume this was like at the peak of that market. So he still made another 200% since then. Yeah. Uh, in the past five years since then. So th if you look at the comments, there's a lot of um, <laughs> bitter, salty Wall Street people telling Bitstein that, you know, he's. Uh, no, 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 you know, you can't just do this. And this is, you're going to get wrecked and you're just a gambler and this isn't going to work out. And, you know, you have to do things the hard way. And so maybe you don't, you know, um, you don't write a better book just because you use a typewriter. Um, it's good to use technology. It's better to uh, travel the, uh, to cross the Atlantic on an airplane than it is to take a kayak. The kayak is more hard work. It's, um, yeah, yeah the, if you think of uh, hard work as being the goal in itself, which, you know, is, is a good kind of mentality to have because you do want to approach life with the, with the mentality of you want to embrace work, you want to enjoy work, but it's not the goal. You know, the point of work is the output you get from work. And so if you do find a shortcut, you should take it. If you find that, you know, maybe I shouldn't take the kayak across the Atlantic Maybe I could just, you know, pay 500 bucks and get on an airplane. That's much better use of my time and my resources and a much safer way of doing it. Then, yeah, you should do it. And so, yeah, so we have all these uh, Wall Street people telling him. And, and the irony is that a lot of them are getting suckered into like the Ethereum ecosystem because there is some fiat ideas woven into that, right? Where they feel like, oh, this is familiar territory, like, you know. Perpetual income. Oh, I've heard of that. You know, staking, it's kind of like buying a bond, you know. Oh, mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I find that hilarious, which is, yeah, you can't just hold Bitcoin. You know, we have to have an equivalent of bonds. No, you don't. I mean, the whole point of bonds was that it would beat inflation. So the bonds are the replacement for holding gold and that you just hold bonds because they offer you a yield that can beat inflation. Well, if your money doesn't suck, you don't need the yield on it. And of course, the really idiotic thing about it is thinking that just because you want a yield, it doesn't mean that a yield can manifest for you. In the words of our uh, old friend, Alan Farrington, where does the yield come from? Just because you want yep. one doesn't mean. <laughs> well, yeah. And then, and then you hear the Ethereum theories about like, oh, it's going to be t five or 10% per year that you can earn. And then, and then you're like, okay, so who's going to? pay for that like oh it's going to be transaction fees like oh okay so because you have ultrasound money you're not going to make more money okay so no inflation so that means the transaction fees how high do they so like you get a, basically an unworkable financial settlement platform to pay for those yields but of course you and i know that that's just promotion talk like those yields are never going to be that high consistently you know it's just it's just lying and cheating. But yeah, it seems like a, a lot of Wall Street people get sucked into that. And the, the way it works in the fiat system is, you know, you have a military and you force people to hold this and you ban them from using alternatives. So that's really, I think, the, uh, <laughs> the only pivot left for the uh, Ethereum people. And it's not that outlandish. I don't think they're going to build a military and force people to use their shitcoin. But it's not a laugh to, to see that CBDCs could be built on Ethereum or they could be uh, using it as a platform. I think, uh, yeah. you know, the people the people that are sick of uh, Bitcoin, um, I, I think we're going to see some alliances as uh, Bitcoin continues to do its thing. We're going to see, mm -hmm. it's not out of the question that, you know, a Vitalik Buterin and Ag Augustin Karsten's <laughs> unite forces. As United. Yeah, I, I remember like five years ago, I remember uh, calculating because I do think it's the only possible end game for something like Ethereum is to to partner with a nation state. So I remember looking at uh, the ruble and like trying to calculate how with the M2 of the ruble and and if by analogy, like if basically, yeah, Ethereum becomes like a, a, a if Russia becomes the protector of Ethereum, I thought maybe the maximum market cap would be like 150 billion or something like that because you know it, it is gonna it's gonna be a lot smaller than if it's an actual Bitcoin contender. Yeah, and you know the good thing that's happening now is that with this um, since 
I, I almost feel like I, um, I, I kind of trolled them into, um, into destroying the Ethereum supply because, you know, they, when, when the, the sound money meme became popular in, because people were reading my book and reading Austrian economics and talking about all of the sound money ideas, you know, the whole point was it's money that nobody can mess with, but they figured that they fixated on the supply growth rate as if that is really the important thing, which isn't, I mean, obviously it is very important, but what's important about it's important that it's low but what's really important is that nobody can mess with it and i, I presume the reading comprehension in these quarters aren't not very good so they fixated on the low supply growth rate and decided to take it a step further in great cargo cult uh, science fashion to go to a negative supply growth rate which i believe is amazing because essentially we are healing nature by eliminating ethereum <laughs> we're just reducing the supply of ethereum so the market cap is declining because there's fewer coins left. And since they did that, it hasn't worked out well for the price so far. So I think this is, you know, the, the free market solution to the Ethereum Ponzi, which is uh, people just keep destroying and burning the supply in transaction fees. And then the supply gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then eventually it goes away. Yeah, the more they jerk the wheel, right? The more they they try and like re-engineer the plane while it's up in the sky, the the sooner it's going to crash. It's it's really interesting to see. I mean, well, how long did Theranos last? I think it was it was like thirteen years or something from inception to uh, conviction. Like Enron was like fourteen years. So you know, Ethereum. Was, yeah, but this Madoff Madoff was like thirty years. So uh, yes, he definitely had a long run. But I think. I think there's a lot more, for better or worse, there's a lot more transparency around Ethereum. So I think it won't be able to have a run that long because, because the game theory is just crazy. Like, you know, the, the, first, the first big guys that get out are going to, you know, pull the rug from under the whole edifice. Yeah. So it's uh, uh, one very intelligent thing that you've said. I, um, I'm not sure if you said it in a tweet or one of your reports a long time ago is that the problem with basing your coin on novelty is that there's always going to be newer, better novelty coming uh, coming through the ranks? Well, more people coming up with more kinds of novelty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, you can always quote back my intelligent quotes. I'll, uh, I I never get enough of that. <laughs> um, but yeah, for sure, they've been. That's what they've been doing. They just kind of went. Uh, they always try to find the new narrative, but they don't. They don't have a monopoly on that. And there's always another coin that's going to claim to be more novel than them. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, I mean, what they need right now is the sort of stability and they kind of, you know, we built this thing, we're the ones who do this thing and we have it and it's stable and you can count on it and you can rely on it. But yet, what is the thing that they do? It's just yeah. an ever shifting sea of buzzwords. Well, you can get JPEG receipts or you can make a yield or you could launch uh, your own coin which then you could use to launch another coin and then another coin and another coin. And it's just, you know, endless novelty for the sake of novelty. And also the zeitgeist has changed. Like we went from ultimate greed, like 2021 was like a bubble in so many areas, like uh, real estate and YOLO stocks. And so that fit really well for Ethereum. But now we're, it's anxiety. Like now it's about risk off. Everybody's trying to, protect the, what they have. And, and I think Ethereum is going to do very badly in that environment. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't write it off completely. I would not be surprised if they managed to um, get another bull run. But I mm -hmm. I think, you know, every day that goes by in which they don't flip in Bitcoin is um, it becomes less and less likely that they will ever do it. It's, it's like that saying, right? Come at the king, best don't miss. And they came at the king and they missed. Yeah, and they missed several, several times. Um, you know, we've we've heard the rhetoric about it being better and more has more applications and all of that stuff. And it's, of course, in, in my opinion, and I presume yours, completely missing the point of what's going on. Mm. But you know, uh, good luck to them too. There's still a lot of fiat people with a lot of fiat ideas and a lot of money. So who knows? The 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 policy might run or longer. Yeah, for sure. So. Uh, so then, what are what are your uh, concrete thoughts about uh, the bullish case for Bitcoin right now? So you were mentioning these indicators that suggest that things are looking up. You think sentiment has changed? Mm. So what do you see happening? Do you think you know they're going to 
have a big bull market similar to the previous bull markets. Do you still see do you still see these cycles going up and down after the halving? Yeah, I think cycles are probably never going to stop, but I do think they can get compressed. Like we can get just faster, faster cycles. But yeah, I do. I do still think because it's such a, um, it's almost like that's why I made the comparison with the 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 Protestant Reformation. Like it, it's it's people's religion is being challenged. Like it's very, it goes so deep, and so the emotions just uh, are 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 part are part of that. Like just the, the these emotional cycles. So I, I just don't see that go away um, anytime soon. The question is like, are we going to have a much higher cycle or, you know, that that's of course another question. We we have been, this has been kind of the, I think the longest bear market that we've seen in the Bitcoin space. And so that's interesting in itself. Like, could that produce a longer bull market as well? I think supply has dried up. You know, you see, for example, now like GBTC, like the premium is starting to go to zero again. Like we, we were trading at, uh, minus 45% for a long time. It's now minus 30%. So basically the supply of cheap Bitcoin, so to speak, or cheap Bitcoin substitutes is drying up. You also see uh, MicroStrategy shares are rising against the price of Bitcoin. So people are kind of trying to scoop that up. And there's only so many Bitcoin in circulation, really, because as the the optimism goes up, as uh, people are in the green, they feel more confident, as hodlers accumulate even more, and and also for example miners they deleveraged during the the bear market so they had some extra bitcoin on their balance sheet and if they had a lot of debt they would sell that to pay off the debt but now the only bitcoins left are with well capitalized bitcoin mining companies who are not going to sell so the question is like where's the supply you know to say with alan farrington <laughs> where's the supply going to come from right and 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 that's what i just don't see like there's very very little supply and eventually that's what makes the price shoot up uh, and I think also with the confidence of Bitcoiners going up, you, you, I notice it, like I become more vocal, like, whereas like, you know, uh, five months ago, I wouldn't really start a conversation about like, Hey, you know, maybe have a look at Bitcoin, you know, I would just kind of shut up about it. And, and then of course, uh, I think the catalyst could be later this year if inflation picks up again, because people think it's over, right? They think, oh, the Fed is going to keep jacking up interest rates and, we're going to maybe have like a stock market bear and, you know, it's going to blah, blah, blah. And, and it's like, no, I really don't think so. We had the highest inflation of 40 years. Uh, if you look at what happened in the 1970s, we had several waves of inflation. Uh, it slowed down sometimes, but then it came back roaringly. And uh, that's what I see, you know, um, later this year is that inflation is going to come back. And with that, that realization of like, oh, my God, they're just never going to stop printing money. And that's, that's that, you know, then the people in the theater start panicking and Bitcoin is one of the few exits that is really left out of this burning fiat theater. So, so your, in your opinion, is going to be inflation and not expansionary monetary policy that's going to drive the next Bitcoin rally? Yeah, that's interesting, actually. I think you're right that uh, CPI inflation actually, actually Bitcoin tends to be early. You know, Bitcoin responds to the stimulus before the inflation is known. But um, that's a good question. I think it could be either. I mean, I, I, I just, I think it could be that the when they start to lower interest rates again, that that's going to be interpreted as like, oh, here we go again. QE is about to start. And so, so with that, you get, you get investments in, in, in gold and Bitcoin and things like that. But also, yeah, I don't know. I just, I feel like just looking at, commodities this is so underinvested like you know relative to Birkenstock and Apple and Apple is now three three trillion dollars like that's a you know that's not an infrastructure company really it's it's um it's by and large a consumer company and so to me that that correct and video is going up which is you know that's actually infrastructure so we need to see more of that and so I just feel like institutional investors at some point are going to catch on that you don't want to buy the Amazon. You want to buy, well, AWS. You could argue is infrastructure, but like you know, you need to see that shift. We need to. We're going to have more investment in, in mining and manufacturing and just very basic utilities stuff like that. So that's kind of where where I'm looking at. I could be I could be too eager to see these things, but I mean, also you have to keep in mind. Maybe that's where you're what you're hinting at is that we have an ongoing banking crisis. Like we've had more bailouts in the past year than we had during 2008 in, in uh, 
inflation corrected dollar terms, uh, but people don't notice it because everybody just assume that all the banks are going to get a bailout. But so if that exacerbates and if we get a crisis in Europe where they're not as good at, at you know, being on top of things, I think then that could spur the next wave of stimulus, you know, the next rescue wave. And then, and then Bitcoin is going to just see a big jump. Yeah. I still hold the deeply unpopular opinion that Bitcoin marches to its own drumbeat. Mm. I mean, again, day to day, there's an infinity of ways in which you can fit Bitcoin's price uh, uh, into any kind of a macro narrative. Interest rates go up, interest rates go down. We did have Bitcoin crash around the same time that uh, monetary policy became restrictive. But I think there's still a very strong case to be made that Bitcoin is still just marching on to what it does, which is whenever there's a halving, there's a supply squeeze, and that leads to a big jump in the price, which then creates a mania, and it continues to go up, and the price continues to go up to reach levels that everybody thinks are just unfathomable. But then at a certain point, you know, when the price, the, I, I think the key point to understand here is Bitcoin it becomes inflationary at high prices. There comes a point when the price of Bitcoin comes up, the value of the mining that comes out, the value of the new coins that comes out is so high that it's effectively like a highly inflationary currency. Yes, the amount of coins that are held are also increasing in value, but you're getting all this, um, but you know, we have all these hardened hodlers that are just going to be holding no matter what the price is. So th there are people that held through the last two years who would have held through anything, you know, whether the price had gone up to 200,000, 15,000, they would have just kept on holding and kept on stacking. So therefore, the sell pressure, yeah, of course, you know, when the price goes up, there is some sell pressure, but there's also a lot of just dogged hodling that goes on that people are just going to hold their existing coins, whatever happens to them. And so therefore, the change in price is enormously consequential in terms of its effect on the new supply. So we're all, you know, the majority of the coins are going to be held by the very hard uh, hands. And then when you have a low price, and, you know, at, at a low price, say, with the current production, which is 900 coins, a relatively low price for this cycle, for the 900 coin epoch, at a relatively low price of, say, 10,000, 15,000 uh, in, in this cycle, Bitcoin is relatively not highly inflationary. You're making around, say, uh, nine million to fifteen million dollars a day of new Bitcoin is being added onto the market, and during this four years, this seems to be pretty much easy for the market to handle. At all points in those four years, we've seen the market handle this kind of sum. But then, you know, the sixty, seventy thousand prices that we had at that level, uh, the um, new coins that are being produced. You know, you have nine hundred coins at sixty thousand. That's $50 million. So $50 million a day of new Bitcoin is a lot of Bitcoin. It's a lot of demand for the market to lap up. And so I think it could well be the case that that's, that, that's how I think of it. That, that's what's really driving things, that when the price is low at the current production schedule, at the 900 coins a day, there's, there are level, you know, there's a level of new demand that is coming into the market. And as the price goes up, we can't keep up with that demand. So we're likely going to witness that crash. And I think, you know, it's very tempting to ignore that and just focus on the day-to-day uh, -day news, you know, the Fed, interest rates, uh, banking crises, et cetera. Mm. But we have not seen this pattern break. Uh, it's still holding on pretty well. well the halving with... pattern is, is pretty strong. Yeah, I agree. The four-year cycle. Um, yeah. 2013 was a bit of an exception. That was a weird year. Um, I mean, in terms of what you're Not saying. Really. But... It, was a, it, was, it was like, the, it, was, it was the same thing. You know, the, the halving was in 2012, November 2012. Mm. And the bull market lasted about 13 months after that. And then the descent started. So we always get that, I think. You know, liquidity probably is what determines where we end up. Things like the China mining ban probably massively affected the increase in that instead of going up, say, to 120, we ended up topping at 60 or 70 or something like that. Could be the case. But 
I still think the overall pattern, you know, so, so what determines those numbers, uh, it could be that the macro things determine where the numbers land, but I think the overall pattern over time seems to be quite, quite robust. And it's, it's, it's not clear to me that I can't just dismiss the idea and say, well, you know, uh, high interest rates brought Bitcoin down. So when interest rates go home, up, or when interest rates go down, Bitcoin's going to go up. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe they continue to tighten and Bitcoin goes up. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I mean, I'd have to look at like data about what miners actually do. Like my, my steel man argument would be that, you know, when Bitcoin prices go up a lot and they're high, miners are actually holding what they mine, most of them. And it's very easy for them to get money to, to expand their operations or to pay, pay for um, expenses. But, but I think in general, what happens is that you get a lot more weak hands entering the market. So like the, the percentage of Bitcoin held by people that, you know, are going to get scared and sell the moment the price goes down 20%, all of a sudden goes up more and more and more. And then eventually you get the cleaning, the cleansing process of the bear market. Where, yep. And so whoever's left now after, you know, when was the peak again? 2021 is like two years later, two years of bear market is is unlikely to sell at all whoever's left and so we have a very solid basis of diamond hands uh, yeah no i, I agree with that and i think also leverage is a big part of this because um you know people start getting over exuberant about it and mm -hmm. they take get in with leverage and you know buying with leverage today is necessarily selling tomorrow you need to sell at a certain point to unwind your position and then the higher the price goes the more leverage, and then eventually the selling. Again, because of the increase in the price, the increase in the in in the selling pressure, and then also the increase in the selling pressure from the leverage. Once you get that downturn, once you get the sentiment shift, everything comes crashing down. Agreed. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't think we're out of that pattern yet, but I do think we are witnessing these cycles compress. It does look like the, you know, the range of the upside and the downside seems to be declining. Who knows? Maybe this will there, there, Did you ever see that chart that's like, because people always have that like rainbow chart of Bitcoin where it's like it goes up algorithmically. But there's another one that makes it show like an S-shaped curve where we, we like, we like, we do have the rainbow for a while and then we actually turn the other way and we go vertical eventually. So it looks like an S. And the argument there is that basically the denominator is melting down, right? And so we have that period of like adjustment in the middle where people are like, is this the real deal or not? And then eventually we go parabolic. That, that's an interesting one to me because that, that really messes with the, the Bitcoin cycles that we know. Like they have to start accelerating to fit that model. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Why is Bitcoin the Reformation? Tell us about that provocative thesis of yours. Oh, yeah. The Bitcoin Reformation. Well, um, back in the 1500s, the Catholic Church had a monopoly on um, basically deciding what happens after, you know, after you die, like you, you go to heaven and they they get to decide uh, based on these these rules and, and whether or not you uh, you negotiated well with the priest or whatever you told them. And so there was this whole hierarchical system that would um, uh, and there were other areas where the, the church had a monopoly on. And so with the printing press and uh, with massively increased income from international trade, that monopoly got challenged. Like people started saying like, hey, like, can't I just read the Bible directly? Like, you know, we can just translate it in our own language. And so they, in a way, they were protesting the monopoly. That's where Protestantism come from, comes from the word. And so the, the analogy I draw in the report is that right now we have um, another monopoly that is... Um, is incurring a lot of cost on society, and that's the the money monopoly, the, the monopoly of central banking and all its subsidiaries around the world that are controlling our financial futures, uh, really, and uh, deciding whether or not grandpa is going to get to retire. And so, Bitcoin is is challenging that. And and the the in terms of like the technology, I draw some analogies between how back in the day water was used because like the empire that was the largest at the time, kind of the equivalent of the American empire today was the Spanish empire. They had massive income from their territories overseas and, uh, and, and some other, some other reasons. And they were basically the, the, the army of the Catholic church. And so when in the, the lowlands, the Netherlands, people started to rebel against this, um, 
some of the largest armies were sent, like over 100,000 soldiers uh, were sent uh, to, to, you know, uh, smash the rebellion and to, to whip everybody back into Catholicism. And the reason why these Dutch rebels were able to withstand for 80 years, it's the 80 years war, uh, is that they used water as a way to, um, to basically um, defeat these, uh, these standing armies, these uh, picadores was the word. Like the, they had the Swiss, um, what is it called? Peaks? Hellebart in Dutch, I don't know. Um, but it was basically post medieval warfare. They had these like long sticks with, uh, with peaks on them. And so they could actually defeat horse mounted forces and knights and stuff. Very, very, uh, but, but so what the Dutch did is they would just open the sluices and flood the land and thereby make it extremely hard for these, uh, Spanish armies to stand their ground and besiege even a small town. Cause that, that was the way to defeat a small town as you would besiege it for many months until you starved it and then they would surrender. But so if you're in the, in the mud and uh, there's all kinds of diseases happening, that that's a lot harder. So, so the equivalent of that today uh, were a very small, physically weak, supposedly, you know, a group of people can withstand the force of a giant empire. Today, I would argue that's cryptography where, you know, just a, a multi-sig key where the keys are stored in a distributed fashion, the FBI or whoever, you know, the strongest uh, military force on the planet cannot crack an encrypted wallet um, if, if they cannot reach every single key. And then in order to do that, you have to know where they are, et cetera. And you have to know how much is in the wallet. And so, and, and that goes for every single Bitcoiner who holds their own Bitcoin. Um, so to me, that is, um, th there's more to it, but that's roughly the analogy that I draw. Yeah. No, it's, I think it's a very good analogy. I mean, there's an almost, uh, it's an almost comical level of analogies that are uh, being uh, leveled at Bitcoin. Everybody comes up with a new analogy for what Bitcoin is. Mm. And I think it's, um, I mean, it, it, you can laugh at it, but it's also, I think, deeply profound because Bitcoin is such a new thing. And it's also such a powerful thing that the, you can see it in so many different ways. You could say, call it digital gold, digital energy, digital reformation, all kinds of things, digital honey badger. There's an endless number of attributes to this thing. Yeah, and I, I've definitely, yeah, tried to find my share of analogies over the years. And still, this one is the, 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 the only one that for me is sufficiently large in scope because this really reshaped society, you know. And, uh, and what came out of it was religious freedom. You know, the, the, the way that uh, New York City was founded was basically not by a religious group. It was by a corporation, the, the East India Co Company. And they just had an outpost there on Manhattan. And then just because it was good for business, they uh, did not allow uh, Peter Stuyvesant, to the, which was the governor at the time, to refuse uh, Jewish immigrants, Portuguese Jews, to come in. He wanted to, to, you know, cast them out because, you know, Jews are, are, are not supposed to live together with Christians, et cetera. And so the home base headquarters in Amsterdam were like, no, 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 Steve, like you're going to allow these people to do business. Uh, and, and so that was the, the germ that founded one of the greatest cities on the planet today. Like, you know, New York City is, is just uh, known for its tolerance uh, with regards to personal lifestyles. And so to me, that's the future. What Bitcoin is, is, is promising to us as well is that, you know, you are free to use whatever monetary medium that you see fit. Like, like we were talking about earlier, like, you know, it doesn't matter what country you're in, you're free to do that. And of course, cer certain countries are going to be Bitcoin friendly. Other countries are going to be hostile. But I think it's the Bitcoin friendly ones that are going to flourish like New York did eventually. Yeah, I agree. Anything else you'd like to tell us um, about your work, your theses, your views about the future? Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm just still, I'm still working on some things. I switched more to long form writing because uh, with, like with the insomnia, I was just, it was, I couldn't get my, my mind together enough to write these long form pieces. But uh, yeah, the past few months I've been writing and so there, there's more stuff coming out later this year, uh, which I'm excited about. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm just, uh, right now I'm, the only thing I would recommend to people is like, have a look at the report. It's 20 pages. I wrote it specifically to be accessible for professionals and interesting enough for financial professionals, but also to be very accessible for family and friends, like people who need like a little extra nudge to get them into Bitcoin. Like this should address a lot of their concerns. And it ends up actually with some 
concrete ways to store Bitcoins that are responsible, but not too complicated. Um, so yeah, I'm proud of it. I, it's, I think it's a great report. Yeah, unfortunately, we didn't have time to get into the storage stuff. Perhaps we'll have you on some other time to discuss all of these issues because I think it's a, it's a very important topic and it's a topic that I probably don't give as much attention in this show because um, it's not exactly my forte. I prefer to focus on the economics, but it is definitely something worthwhile. So yes, please do check out Tour's uh, report, all of his reports. And um, yeah, let's know, where can people find you on the internet? What are your uh, hangouts? Just go to adamantresearch.com. So A-D-A-M-A-N-T, research.com. Excellent. Well, Tour, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your time, for all your insight and wisdom over the years. And uh, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Cheers.